I'm Frank Partnoy, and I'm the author of Wait, the Art and Science of Delay. This is a book about the role of delay in decision making. Uh, there's been a lot of thinking and writing about how we make decisions, about why we make certain kinds of decisions, about what we should decide. There hasn't been as much writing or thinking about when, and so I wanted to explore the question of what the ideal timing of decisions is and how that varies over time. There's a tremendous literature on decision making generally going back for decades, and I teach decision making and do research on decision making primarily in the business and financial area. And one of the challenges of Wait was trying to stitch together different aspects of the decision making literature to try to understand different buckets of time, uh, to try to pool together behavioral economics and psychology and neuroscience research as it relates solely to decisions that take milliseconds, and then do the same thing for decisions that take seconds, and then the same thing for decisions that take minutes, and so, so on, as the temporal time frame is elongated. And so one of the uh, challenges was to uh, read widely and, and try to understand uh, all of these literatures and what their connections are, and then also to um, look more recently at the what I'd call a pushback in various aspects of decision sciences against the idea that snap decision making is good or is always good. Uh, in the last several years, a number of researchers have shown, I think, quite compelling evidence that uh, two seconds is not the optimal time for all decisions. And so I wanted to bring those decisions, uh, that decision literature and that research uh, also to bear some of which, frankly, is not published. Um, and then in addition to the literature, I also wanted to find real-world examples and interview people who have confronted the crush of technology and 24-hour news media and email and social media and the Internet and who have been successful in confronting this crush of technology and continue to make good decisions. And so, so I wanted to weave together with the decision-making literature uh, a series of interviews with successful CEOs and senior executives and senior political leaders to try to understand how that um, uh, capacity to make good decisions in the teeth of technology relates to the recent literature. I think so. I think, um, and I think the common quality is the strength and wisdom uh, to step back and think about the big picture and to understand what time frame a particular decision requires and to not be influenced by either the crush of technology or often um, people's own experience and hardwiring. Uh, I think this really is a lot of what people refer to as leadership or wisdom is the ability not to react like an animal. If you think about sort of what distinguishes human beings from animals, it really is our ability to think about the future, to take a step back and not react instantaneously. Um, the cover of Wade has a golden retriever with a bone perched on her snout. And in some ways, she's a role model for all of us because it's hard for a dog to delay gratification even for a few seconds. But, but also, uh, one of the instructive aspects of that photo, I hope, is that we can do better than that dog. And I think what a lot of leaders understand is that one of the reasons they've become successful is that when they're confronted with something that other people might think of as a crisis, they're able to take a moment and step back and understand that it's really not a crisis, that they're, um, ha this is a road that people have been down before, and that if they take some time, that they'll be able to um, maneuver in a, in a, in a much more uh, skilled, adept, thoughtful way. And, and also, frankly, that they're able to think um, more carefully about the future consequences of quick action. That they, uh, again, it's this human capacity to contemplate the future. One of the fascinating things that, that I found in three years of research was that 
this same kind of model kept coming up over and over again, this two-step process of first asking, what time world am I living in? What is the maximum amount of time I could delay this decision? So when you get an email, rather than thinking instantly, how quickly can I respond to this email? Instead, think the opposite. What's the longest amount of time I could take to respond? So if it's a tennis player uh, responding to a professional tennis serve, the maximum amount of time is about 450 milliseconds. If you wait longer than that, the ball has gone by. Um, for an apology, it might be slightly longer. It might be that you can wait several days or a week rather than apologizing instantaneously. So the first set of questions, and I found that people um, in all aspects of decision making who make good decisions will start by consciously or unconsciously, amazingly for professional athletes, it's unconsciously, uh, contemplating that question of what is the maximum amount of time and then the second step, the second question, is really about procrastination. It's about delaying as much as possible within that time frame so that the best professional athletes, the best tennis serve returners, are able to wait until the last possible moment within that, that 450 milliseconds that they have available. That, that Jimmy Connors was really such a great tennis returner, not because he was fast, but because he was slow. Because he perfected his stroke with such skill that he's able to wait an extra 50 milliseconds. That's what the research on super fast athletes suggests, uh, that 50 milliseconds defines the difference between a professional and an amateur. And so that Connor's ability to create that extra time, to wait an extra 50 milliseconds, um, enables him to uh, return serves in a more proficient, uh, efficient, better manner. And that that uh, appears over and over again, that the same is true of apologies that apologies that are delayed as long as possible are more effective. And again, it's counterintuitive because we're taught as children, you should say you're sorry right away. But the research on apologies shows that there are really two key factors that matter with apologies. One is making sure that the aggrieved party has as enough time to process information about what it is you've done wrong, that they can understand the who, what, where, why, all of the details. And the second factor is giving them time to vent, giving them time to be angry at you. So that if you accidentally spill a drink on someone at a party, if it's an unintentional, simple act, you should apologize right away. But if it's a complicated act, if it's intentional, if it's infidelity or um, a serious uh, transgression at work, that you actually want to do the opposite, that you want to ask this first question, what's the maximum amount of time I could wait until I apologize? And then second, you want to procrastinate. You want to delay your apology until the last possible moment. And, and in the book, I go through a number of examples of politicians and entertainment stars um, who apologize effectively or ineffectively. And one of the key factors, as research suggests, really is, are they able to figure out the right amount of time to delay and then delay that long? One of the really interesting things about how very skilled decision makers and reactors approach events is that they, they do seem to grab in advance um, a huge amount of expected content of the event and incorporate that into their then ex post later uh, decision process or reaction process. Um, this is what Gary Klein, the research psychologist, calls a pre-mortem. Not a post-mortem, a pre-mortem. In other words, to, to in advance try to understand uh, how something might go wrong, to try to intuit ex ante what kinds of factors might matter to your decision when it happens, ultimately, and to prepare yourself for that so that you won't be subject to the foibles of your own hardwiring. Um, and this is what tennis players do when they practice their stroke in advance and try to uh, know in a match uh, what kinds of serves they might confront. For them, it's all pre-conscious. Uh, Benjamin Libet, the neuroscientist, showed that there's a 500 millisecond consciousness barrier so that they're not going to be able to think while they're returning a serve. It's simply not possible for human beings to engage in conscious thought in that short a period of time. Um, 
but that the same kind of pattern holds when we are able to engage in, in conscious thought, that, um, that we can plan for the crisis moment to imagine the worst case scenario. Um, it would have been nice if banks had done this in advance of the financial crisis. Um, unfortunately, they didn't. Some of them are using the pre-mortem strategy now. But effective decision makers in all aspects of life do this. Bill Belichick, the coach of the New England Patriots, is a great example he is extremely well prepared for high pressure situations at the end of games. He constructs premortems. He reads the literature on when you should go for it on fourth down. So he knows exactly what to do at the end of games so that when he faces the pressure, the crush of his uh, own biology, that he will be able to respond in a way that is thoughtful, even though he might not have the capacity for actually thinking all this through because it's done it in advance. And, and one of the things that you do during, during a pre-mortem when you're trying to anticipate being in a situation is thinking through the context of that situation so that you understand the substance of what might confront you. So that a, a bank, for example, might think in advance, bankers, the leaders of a bank, the risk managers, might think in advance, what should we do if housing prices decline 30%, let's construct a pre-mortem. Let's ask the question, let's imagine that we've lost $100 billion, and let's try to understand why it happened and what we should do. Um, let's think about all of that in advance so that when we're put in this kind of crisis mode, that we won't just react based on our biology, that we'll sort of be prepared for it. It's very kind of you to suggest that the four books, or the four trade books I've written are related in some way. I'm not sure that they are, um, but, but maybe they are. And, and really the impetus for, for this book was partly driven by um, my studying finance and the financial crisis, but, but really it's because I've always been a procrastinator. Um, since elementary school, when my mom would try to get me to make my bed every morning, um, and I came up with arguments that are very similar to the sort of two-step analytic approach of weight, uh, arguing that the right time frame for making my bed is much longer than just a few minutes in the morning, that I'll just be sleeping in it again later, so why should I make it now? And, and even after school, I would argue that um, even if my mother represented that there were people coming over, that we had guests coming over at 6 o'clock, I would say, well, it only takes me a minute to make my bed, so I'll wait until 5.59. And moreover, what if they decide not to come? I should wait until there's hard evidence that they're there. I want to see a car in the driveway. I want to hear a knock at the door. That the right way of approaching a decision like making my bed is, first, what time world am I living in? And second, let me wait as long as possible. So in some sense, this book, Wait, has been the culmination of my life as a procrastinator. Um, but, but, but to try to make a connection to my uh, previous books in finance, the, the other driver was thinking about the rash snap decisions that were made in the financial crisis and that, that I've written about before. Um, in both Fiasco and Infectious Greed, I talked about uh, decisions that were, that were made that if there had been sufficient reflection probably would not have been made if... Um, if, if, if the people in Orange County had thought through the risks associated with structured notes before they bought them, um, if, if people had thought through the risks associated with Mexican peso denominated uh, investments and derivatives before they had bought them, that, that maybe we would have been, uh, they would have been more, more careful. Maybe they wouldn't have taken on these risks. And, and I learned an interesting story about Lehman Brothers in the financial crisis, which is that Lehman Brothers... Uh, tried to design a decision-making course for their executives that drew on a lot of the literature that, that I draw on. Um, this was back in fall of 2005. They took four dozen of their executives and holed them up at the Palace Hotel on Madison Avenue in Manhattan, and they brought in decision-making experts to talk to them about uh, biases in their own decisions, about uh, some of the research on decision-making. They brought in people from Harvard Business School, uh, well-known psychologists. They designed a custom implicit association test. And then they brought in um, Malcolm Gladwell as the capstone lecturer. He had just published his bestseller, Blink, which was really more balanced in its approach to decision-making than, than many people read it to be. The last third of Blink was about 
some of the dangers of snap decision making. It focused on the police shooting of Amadou Diallo in the Bronx and the gender bias and music auditions. Um, but the people at Lehman didn't want to read the last third of Blink. They took a different message, which was that two seconds is really the optimal time for decisions, maybe even faster than that. The president of Lehman Brothers, Joe Gregory, passed out copies of Blink on the trading floor and urged traders to go with their gut. And so Lehman Brothers took this course, and then they marched back across Manhattan to their headquarters in Times Square and proceeded to make the worst snap decisions in financial market history. And one of the things I thought was, wow, the people on Wall Street are really taking the wrong decision-making course, or they're taking the wrong lessons from the decision-making literature. And so I'd like to try to present them with a, a more balanced, more nuanced um, uh, read of that literature, and also to update the literature in response to the way Blink was received, because a lot of decision scientists um, reacted very negatively, not only to Blink itself, but to the way Blink was interpreted by the public. And so I wanted to reflect that literature, and I hope that people on Wall Street going forward will think much more carefully and take more time with their decisions than they have in the past.